Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the show. Today I am talking to South Africa's knowledgeable man, man about our most important period, apartheid. So Professor Herman Gilomir, he worked at uh, the University of Cape Town and he was also a uh, honorary professor at the University of Stellenbosch, to my understanding. And he has dedicated a lot of his life writing about apartheid. And he's also, um, even last year, I believe, he published a, a book. So he's, he's in his 80s and he's still writing. Prof. Gilomir, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah. So, so Prof, I want to... Let me let me start with uh, questions. Okay, apartheid, and this is a, a term and a concept in South Africa that has been weaponized by the media. And in my view, the people who say the most about apartheid know the least about it. Can you briefly explain to people what was the difference between apartheid and segregation? And so, what what in the question is what does apartheid have in common with other forms of segregation worldwide, and what made it different? Well, apartheid in a certain sense is a form of segregation, but uh, it's a term that developed in the 1940s. It was only, it was first used in South African politics in the year 1943 and in Parliament 1944. It says that it's different from segregation, that in segregation it is just a matter of trying to, what they call crawling off, separating out the blacks and the colored people and putting them on the margins, whereas in the case of apartheid, the intention was to uh, bring them to, to them education, bring them a, self, a sense of, of personal worth in terms of their own ethnic background and to develop that ethnic history and ethnic culture. So it was different in the sense that your culture, your language, and that's the most valuable part of the aspect. Don't try and mimic the white ways. Of but obviously, in the case, that, uh, in, in the case of Africans, there was a culture intact. In the case of the colored people of South Africa, they had no other culture than the Western culture. So it made really no sense to try and segregate them and say, you should be separate from their own culture. Okay, so the you speak here about culture. Now, I want to make an important point here. If you read the text of Nazism, for example, uh, the text of Goebbels and of uh, Hitler, the Nazis believed in racial superiority. But if you read the words of Verwurten and Malan and Herzog and those guys, they rejected evolution in, in their doctrine. And their emphasis was on culture. And can you explain why that distinction is so important? Well, I think in the case of Afrikaners, it was such a vital element to try and develop, not to succumb to the, to the might of this culture, to develop your own culture, to develop your own sense personal work in terms of your own culture, your own history. Most people uh, in South Africa, most other colonies, uh, there's not a conscious effort of a very small group to try and develop their own culture. And the Afrikaners, they did very well in actually developing their own culture and to refuse to become British to refuse to become a surrogate English speaker, surrogate, uh, surrogate British, and they said, we are finding some personal worth in our own history, in our own culture. And, and they, we've, we've, as you can always say, we've made this wonder, wonderful discovery that we are a separate people, and now we want other people also to be separate. But, but obviously you can't impose it from above on other people. They must, they must themselves reach out for that and say, look, this is how I choose my identity, and that's what, that the Afrikaners didn't do. So, so the Afrikaner leadership mistake, let, let, let's go back to history. 1948, the uh, Afrikaners come and get power, and D.F. Malan runs on the doctrine of apartheid. Um, but of course, apartheid didn't start in 1948. Jan Smuts, I believe, used it in a speech already in the 1930s. And I think you're on record for saying that um, Hendrik Verwoerd is not really the true architect of apartheid. It actually precedes him. Can you, can you maybe explain that? Uh, well, uh, Jan Smuts uh, is still clung to the word segregation. As far as I know, I never knew the, used the word apartheid. Apartheid only was used in Parliament for the first time in 1944. And in the, in the, in the, in the Cape Town Afrikaans newspaper only in 1943, I think. 
but very often apartheid had this element that Dr. Malang used to say, uh, segregation is simply a question of pushing people out, black people and colored people out to the margins, whereas in the case of apartheid, the idea is to give them a proper education in the, about their own language, in their own, in their own tongue, in their own medium, in, the, in their own home language, and make them proud of the, that home language and, and to develop their own culture. That was the ideology of apartheid. But obviously, uh, identity is not something that you can say to somebody, you must try and find your own identity and I'll help you to find it and I'm going to punish you if you don't play along, you know. Uh, you can only, only develop an identity if it's freely chosen as your own. You can't have it imposed from the outside, you know. And I guess that was the the grand mistake, if you read Malan and Verwoerd, and the, uh, the biggest mistake was this paternalistic attitude towards the black South Africans. Yeah. And in the search for the Afrikaners of their own identity, they try to tell others what their identity ought to be. No, it's very, uh, they never realized it. They were very paternalistic identity, you know. So look, I, I, I don't tell you what your identity is, and then you must try and uh, give content to that identity, you know, and uh, that, that doesn't work that way. Yeah. Um, so Afrikaner nationalism, of course, was uh, a blend of Calvinism. It had religion in it. Uh, you know, language was very important. You, you know, I often ask myself, what is the difference between the white English speakers in South Africa, the white groups in South Africa? What's the difference between the English and the Afrikaners? And maybe when you grew up, it was more obvious. But in these days, I suspect it's only only language. Well, so I, I, that's uh, I'm, I'm sure an abbreviated version of uh, my condensed book on the Afrikaners that appeared three days ago. And I have a very wonderful epigraph that I used from Alan Faiton, who wrote on the Afrikaners and the English in the year 1981. And he said, the English speaking people of South Africa, I'm quoting now, have only one thing in common, and that is their language. We are a mixed bunch, this is now the English, and we don't have the bonds that bind so many Afrikaners together. We never had a career, we never trekked, we never developed a new language, we were never defeated in war, we never had to pick ourselves out of the dust. And that is uh, Alan Payton in 1981, and I think that's really a brilliant summary, you know, what, 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 uh, what, what, what uh, is different in our case. I've got two English sons-in-law, and I always say, say to them, with English speakers, speak, speakers of South Africa, it's achieved a, uh, a, a, absolutely, absolutely amazing thing. They've managed to disinvent themselves as a community. They just say, no, we just, oh, boys from this school, we are, we, we're not a community. <laughs> just what they hang up with them, about community and all that. I, I would extend that to the English speakers in, in, in the entire world, with maybe the exception of the United States, um, that you find that th th there's an attitude of, of right, rigid individualism, and, and this dis dissolves the, the community around you. And I guess the, it is part of the British culture as well to, to go into rigid individualism. And, and to an extent, you know, you tend to forget what your culture and what your society around is all about. And I find it quite interesting now that Europe is seeing levels of migration that's unprecedented. Um, give a good example, the Swedes. The, the white Swede today will grow up being a, grand, uh, a grandfather of non-white Swedes. Okay, the majority of children in, in, in uh, the UK, for example, and there's an extent the United States, will not have English speaking roots. And I find it very interesting that those very same cultures are now trying to almost rediscover themselves. You find authors like Douglas Murray who tries to tell us what British culture is about, Peter Hitchens, right? You, you, see, you see them making the argument of culture because at this, now they are for the first time coming to terms that they might not be a majority in their own country. Okay. Strange things happen to people when they suddenly discover they are the same. They are actually seeking down from being master, being majority, being the majority, to becoming a certain minority, you know. And then they suddenly all the sort of the pleasantries and the kind of uh, uh, hypocrisies started becoming exposed, you know. And this is very much happening to the English in, in Britain at the moment. 
And I think it happens into some place, some part of America, which I think that explains the Trump, Donald Trump phenomenon, you know. Is Donald Trump, according to you, purely an expression of culture? Yeah, it's American arrogance at its worst, you know. It is the, the idea that, uh, but also a threatened. It's not a, the super, supremely confident uh, person who don't even have to actually uh, articulate his superiority. He, he, Donald Trump does it in a very blunt and crude and uh, off putish way, you know, that we are, we are the top, we have always been the top, but we will remain on top. But simply making that claim shows that you're uncertain of yourself, that you're not quite certain whether you will prevail. Yeah, you know, I think it was Samuel Huntington that said of Davos, you know, that famous uh, group that uh, they see themselves as the masters of the universe, you know, and they're, they're going to discover that they are not the masters of the universe. No, I couldn't. Say, I couldn't. I couldn't think it would happen to nicer people. Yeah, I think uh, they. Uh, uh, you know, the Afrikaners at least have learned of by of the losing power. They, they, there's a certain humility has developed. And so look, we we can no longer push push people around. We can no longer tell people how they actually should actually experience their own culture and their own descent and their own background. We realize that this is this is the most important thing that people must define it for themselves. You can't do it for them. You know? That's right. So we talk here, you know, a lot about culture. And I guess this was a constant theme that came over throughout apartheid. And um, can you explain maybe why the Afrikaners look toward culture, and following from that, why? Okay, it was a point you made to me before we start this video that in the what made the Afrikaners different was that they detached themselves from Europe. They said we are African. Afrikaner means African, right? In Herzog, I think, was one of the, the first guys to use it. And so they see themselves as part of the land of Africa and they want to be African, but yet they have a European culture. And this makes it difficult for the um, for the black Africans to assimilate towards them because the culture is inherently hostile to the, to the black communities and the black intellectuals. Yeah. No, sure. The Afrikaners, uh, I said the way, so to some extent, quite mixed, but also, you know, they, they consider their culture, the fact that they develop their own language, the Afrikaans has been developed as a written language, as a language of, of, of communication, as a university language. It's only about three or four languages in world history that, that, that succeeded in doing that. And Afrikaners had to compete against English in their own country, you know, uh, and with the entire commercial sector, industrial sector in English hands. So it, it was an incredible achievement to actually uh, achieve that, uh, to, to succeed in that. And uh, so much of Afrikaners in went into that. Uh, in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. What they didn't know, of course, they had no way of trying to find some uh, political settlement where, where, where numbers wouldn't be decided. So Afghans obviously were beneficiaries of, of the numbers game in, in the white political system between 1910 and 1990 because they were the 51% of the 57% of, of the white electorate. But suddenly after 1994, they were only a small minority and then now about four or five the population. But Afghan had that, 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 that history, had had a kind of a difficult history in the sense of that uh, change and uh, adaptation to their life, lifestyle and civilization was complete on your own, you must compete, but simply by producing Afghan's books and Afghan's music. Uh, and, and the English books uh, for English news that was published in South Africa. That was a, you know, was a, the moment of the past press was in a better state than, than the English news in South Africa. So, so on that, yeah, you said the Afrikaans press is in a better state. I mean, that's a, an important observation. And, and are you, I guess, more confident that the Afrikaners will? I want to say, still stay in Africa and still find self-expression in Africa because they still value their language and their culture and, um, you know, 
because when I look at South Africa from the outskirts, you, you see the most mobilized group at the moment against the government. What well, is two is a democratic alliance and Afri Forum and solidarity. And you've got this big group making a cultural statement, you know, whether you agree with them or not. And, and do you think that there's there's hope in that in that movement that they will ultimately survive? You know, because at the, at, Alan Payton said it best to me. He said the Afrikaner has always had two problems. He said it's been the native problem and it's been the English problem. Yeah, I see, yeah, yeah. No, so I think the Afrikaners have got problems, but I think they have the uh, statement of base. Like Afrikaners. They will never accept Afrikaners. They will never accept Afrikaners. They want leaders and leaders back to uh, cultural ghettos, you know, but uh, like a like a, a holiday park or something like that, you know, but uh, the, the point is actually the Afrikaners won't go away and there's a certain tenacity that I that I that's very clear in Afri Forum and uh, Solidarity and I think uh, slowly, slowly, I think the Afrikaners are regrouping, you know, because they are clearly not the favorite people of the government of today, you know. Yeah, I, I would extend to that even in the world. Um, if you look at Hollywood films, you just put either a, reaction, a Russian or an Afrikaans accent and you automatically assume to be racist. And... Some of that we have preserved, you know, but sometimes you know, people are just looking for a scapegoat, you know, and uh, Afrikaans is quite accustomed to being a scapegoat. You know? Yeah, that's great. So I want to speak here about Arnold Toynbee. Um, we spoke about him a little bit earlier. He wrote the amazing book, The Rise and Fall of Civilizations. And, and you said Arnold Toynbee had some words for South Africa as well at the time. And uh, he, he saw that the, um, the European colonists in Africa in the long run would not survive. He predicted this. And I, I think he was correct in many French colonies and all these countries. Um, can, you, can you speak maybe how Arnold Toynbee influenced your thinking you know, as a historian? Well, I think Tom Trinby has given the best, uh, made the best forecast about what will happen in South Africa. I mean, it was 19, uh, what was it, in 1959 that he uh, got a request from a leading Afrikaans person, a person, a leading cultural, uh, cultural organization, Pete Mayer, he was head of the South African Broadcasting Corporation. And the mayor asked him, what is, what is our prospect? He said, look, you're a shrinking minority. And the point is actually uh, it's very difficult for the people to go from a position of dominance to being, uh, to being pushed out to the margins culturally, politically, and all so on. But there's so many ironies. If you take, for instance, the Afrikaans press is in a much stronger situation than the English press at the moment. Obviously, it's thanks to, to, uh, to the wonderful investment that National Affairs made in ten cents and so on, you know, and, uh, then one of the big, big technology firms on a ball, they've got a, a 33% share in one of the big technology firms in the world, you know, uh, in sense. Uh, so I think that with all of this, it's just when you call it, want to write them off and say, look, they've got no pros prospects whatsoever, then suddenly there is a comeback, you know, that you look at the literature, you look at novels, you look at, 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 at history, you know, I, I, I can take my own example, I think they expect it that in my books will actually, some of them will actually sell out, uh, will, will, will be sold out, you know, that you have, have to reprint and all that. And there is this intense uh, interest of Afghanistan in their history. Uh, and uh, I, I think that we, 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 we must try and write the history in such a way that it's true to your own profession, namely the writing of history, and you must try and read the Afrikaners, not, not the academics. You know. And I spent my life uh, as an academic and with other academics. They're the last person that I try to, to, to read because they think they've got the answers to them. Yeah, the, um, I think it's the American Thomas Sowell who, who makes the important point that the academics see themselves as the anointed, you know, the wise men who can rule our lives for ourselves and who can think for ourselves. And uh, I, I think worldwide, that is a very common observation that you find that academia is becoming entirely detached from reality. 
um, you know, on so many different ways. You see it in engineering and mathematics, my very own field. You know, what they teach us in academics and what we do in practice is entirely two worlds apart. And I, I think that's important also for authors and writers. You know, I think the average person is a lot more common sense than an academic. And I'm, not, I'm not writing my books for academics. The last people I have in mind, you know, I was beaten at conferences and debated and so on. You know, but I always said that I want to read uh, the the person, in the, uh, the man in the street who's, who's taken the interest in the world around him and his own history. You know? I mean, I, it's in fact better that he doesn't have a university education. You know? uh, because academics live in their own service in the world. And I've had the uh, interesting experience of half my academic career. I think about the Khan University, but still I was in the second half at, at the University of Cape Town. So I, I know the cultures of both, of both universities. and. Uh, that's what strengths and weaknesses they put, have a rare inability to look at themselves the way in which other people see them. There's, there's an interesting new book come, came out in America called Neo-Feudalism, A Warning to the Middle Class. And he speaks to this point that, uh, I mean, it's the same argument. I think you can, you can go back through the ages that the, um, the academics tend to be the Jacobins and uh, the, the commoner, I think it's Victor Davis Hanson, an American historian, who says that he would rather judge Ju uh, trust the, uh, the, the judgment of the ordinary common person in that of elite opinion. And I think we see this expression constantly, and it's a constant theme throughout history, that the, uh, the commoners don't like the, the elites that much, and it's because they feel detached from them. No, it's just academics. It's an uh, ivory tower. And, uh, I mean, uh, the point is actually they must come down and they must come, come, come to the marketplace and share views in the marketplace. Yeah, that's right. So, um, yeah, I, I, I totally agree that. So you're basically saying, because I mean, on the news media and on the press, everyone is now uh, talking about postmodernism and whatever that means and, and Marxist thinking. And lots of people are criticizing the academics, but you're actually saying this has always been the case. The academics have always been detached from reality. Well, not the Afrikaner academics in the, in the, you know, in the 1950s and 40s and 50s, you know, that because you had actually had to I think uh, fairly, the Afrikaners were a fairly poorly educated people, you know, and you have to tell them that you must go to high school, you must go to university and all that. So this actually was a wonderful achievement uh, of the Afrikaners to put themselves up as a largely, you know, uh, rural, rural, and not poorly educated people to, to come and to, to turn up the country with only four languages, but it seems in the 20th century to uh, to, to, to develop from a, from a patwa, from a common uh, sort of street language market to a uh, university language. Now, Afrikaans is one of the four, you know, and uh, that was uh, actually, a, it's not only Afrikaans as a language, but it's also a, a separate kind of uh, cultural tradition that you develop. The way in which you look at history, you, the way in which you look at, 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 at society and so on. And that is actually something wonderful that you can try and achieve that. Of course, some of it, there were certain excesses. I mean, apartheid was part of the excesses. I mean, you actually made a, a kind of almost a, a, both, a, both a monument to culture. And a culture doesn't want monuments. They want very good novels. They want good poetry, good history, and so on. Uh, sorry. Hello? Uh, uh, yeah. uh, so, uh, ach, you know, I think I've been, I think I always think I've been very fortunate in having grown up in, in Afrikaner society and got, got to know Afrikaner society in both, and there was good in it, and I've also seen some, some of the parts of it that is not very attractive and so on, but. Uh, it is, uh, it is good to belong to a small nation. I don't want to be part of a, of a big powerful nation like the Americans or the Brits or so on. You know? Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. You know, um, when I when I come here to France, you know, the French have got the same attitude that the English has got. Um, everything has to be French or else, you know. Uh, but I, I tend to, to agree. And, and as a consequence, they don't see their own culture. They, they, they don't appreciate, I would say, all the aspects of human nature because they are from a majority culture. Um, but I, I've got, you know, this is a, that was a very interesting point that you made. I see you've seen 
the history of South Africa. And I mean, you grew up in the 1930s. Okay, this is a very long time. You're in the same age my grandfather was. And how much do you think South Africa has changed since then? And, and I guess it has changed for the better and it has changed also for the worse. You know, history is not a, a straight line towards progress all the time. But like, uh, can you maybe explain the world you grew up in and how much, if you fast forward to 20, you know, what are we, 2020, and you're now connecting with me through a cell phone to France, you know, how, how much has that changed? In, in, in... It's changed almost, uh, you know, you, you can never imagine that kind of technological changes in the way in which you communicate with God. I was sitting here, and you know, was you sitting in Paris, and you, we're having a normal conversation, you know, and, and we're doing it in the enemy's language, you know, that is, uh, <laughs> but, uh, it, 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 is, it, it is a remarkable, I've been very fortunate in the time that I've listed now. I mean, I, could, I couldn't, do, couldn't dream of having a more interesting topic than the Afrikaans. I mean, I, I, I mean, in the story that I was told about the Commonwealth Conference in the 1940s or 1950s, and there was a, a, a Afrikaans historian who went over to a man standing alone in the corner of the, of the conference room, and he said, what, are you, what, 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 what's your discipline? He said, look. I'm an Australian historian. Can you imagine anything more boring? <laughs> and uh, and uh, we are just blessed with a very, very fascinating history. You know? Yeah, that is, uh, I, I totally agree with that. When I talk to, to say, to my French counterparts, and I've got, uh, you know, the, the people I would say who are my friends friends in, in, in France are not the French. It is the Algerians, it is the, um, it is the Iranians, it is the Lebanese, it is the Indians. It, it is people that have a comparable history to ours. And, and the reason is they understand the dynamism of society and they can understand how quickly things can fall apart or, or, or also spontaneously they can start working again. I think I'm going to be who's up on the farm South Africa fascinating. Uh, to that. I have lots to say about you know, the different cultures here in South Africa. Yeah, I want to ask you about. So, to my understanding, you you're one of the few remaining people that has spoken to to Fervurt and to um, Foster. Um, you, know, you know, what what were your interactions with them as a historian? You know, to the the Afrikaner history, uh, leaders at the time, and obviously, what were your impressions of them? At the farm in the northern farm ball, and Fervurt and Fervurt family came for the weekend as well because he was addressing a meeting in, 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 in town and in Kroberstal. And so I sat next to him at breakfast in town. You know, and uh, how he actually, uh, as the conversation was flowing, how, how, how he would take a certain in a incoherent statement and rephrase that into an absolutely compelling argument uh, for something, you know, for or against something. Uh, but would have an enormous presence, an enormous intellect. You, you, you were just aware of it right, right from the start. And I think he's, it's, it's uh, I mean, it made some very unfortunate statements and so on, but he's still the most uh, underrated figure in our history. You know, uh, of course, the Afrikaners actually were completely mesmerized by him. But uh, Foster was actually a very interesting man. He had a very sort of earthy gimmel, you know, he was immediately. As a try and throw for your for your weak point, you know, I asked him why he was he's already retired from politics. Now. I asked him how why didn't you do more and why didn't you embark on more reforms? Why well, for instance he doesn't he didn't pull in the colored people and you know as part of the white community. He said, oh, you, you like the English, they want the the fruiters of hundred miles, but you don't want the posters of kilometers. You know, you just <laughs> It does have the knack of, of, of seeing your weak point in your argument, you know. And, but he was enormously uh, uh, entertaining to talk to. You know? uh, I've never met, I've never had an encounter with Prince of the Wood Army. I believe he once referred to me and a co author as uh, uh, Stakes in the Grass, you know, he was, wasn't prosperous. <laughs> In any case, uh, no, I, I've, I've, I've been a really interesting life for uh, writing about both politics and history. And I want to get to that. You said the Afrikaners were mesmerized by the Fervurt. Do, do you believe in extent that we had a, a cult of personality around him because of his presence, because he was a psychologist, because of his way of, 
I guess, framing a debate. You know, he, he was a debate champion, to my understanding. And, and of course, you know, anyone that's done debating would know that persuasion is, uh, you know, it teaches you the skills of persuasion. And Favurt had the skills of persuasion, right? So do, do you think there was a cult of personality because of his uh, abilities? Uh, he could have been rich because he was not in any other society. He simply had the ability, had the intellect, had the personality, he could project it, you know, he... Uh, he had enormous presence, you know, uh, uh, and uh, unfortunately there is no good biography of him, but he was, uh, he was actually, uh, uh, I, I've got a married son who was professor of theology and so on as well, and we often speak about it and so on, he just wants to have, a, his great desires, there must be a, a, a good biography of his father must be written, but that, I don't think that we should be grounded in our lifetime. No, no, certainly not. I mean, he, he became the Dr. Doom. And as you said, um, you know, yes, he did expand the apartheid regime and everything. But um, whether or not he entirely deserves the title architect of apartheid is, is up for historical dispute. And my view is, if I read the history, I think it's, uh, you know, you can make the same case for Cecil Rhodes and for Alfred Milner and for, um, you know, Herzog, Smits. You know, they all contributed. It was a systematic encroachment. On, on, on the regime and on the rights of the natives and also for the survival of the Afrikaans people because that was their primary uh, determinant outcome. They, they, they wanted to survive at all costs and uh, in the process of doing so, I, I guess this is my next question to you. Why is it that the Afrikaners, given the atrocities of the Anglo-Boer War, could not extend their hand to the black South Africans much earlier on? That's a question I got from a black friend here. Yeah, it is, uh, you know, I, I think that we, there's a lot of common between us and, and, and the Blacks, you know, we were both uh, started, the both groups started uh, urbanizing in the early 20th century. There were poor that came from the farm, come from the land and so on. I once uh, put this uh, comparison to a, to a Black editor, you know, who was, I don't know, I got along with it quite well and said, I said, there's so much that is, the same of our, of our different histories. He said, yes, but there's one big difference. You had the land. <laughs> we didn't have <laughs> And obviously that's true. We, we, we think that we're the same. And we remember the Africans had to have an ice, well, uh, like the Afrikaners, but they had no farms on which to fall back on. When you think about the whole development of Africa, how important that the burger and the new slavery in Cape Town <clears throat> <clears throat> was started by some, you know, Western Cape farmers who actually also formed the Talbos, the, the district bank, you know, so, and when they, and the Africans have no equivalent to that, but we still expect them to perform in almost in the same way as we, as we had performed. And so I, I had a, a person on my channel from the Free Market Foundation um, last Wednesday, and he spoke about apartheid, but not from a racial point of view, but from a a geographic point of view and he said you know apartheid if you look at it analysis rationally and you you over you, you racism was obviously the part of it but the primary outcome according to him has been geography it restricted geography it, it they had town zones um you know towns were zoned in certain ways um you had the bantu stunts you know did, did you agree with that assessment that it was primarily driven by geography Spatial or space to, to reorder space, you know, that, that is it, you know, and then demarcate space and so on. So it, it's, a, it's a battle for urban spaces, you know, and, uh, and, and actually to keep them uh, just enough for, for, for uh, uh, townships, uh, just enough um, uh, housing accommodation and so on, but not providing for vibrant city, city, city communities, you know, that is, uh, that this was the great tragedy that this is what Dr. Wood had in mind when he came to power, that when he became minister in 96. And he said, I want the black cities to be fully self-sufficient uh, and they must get full self-government and they must have start their own enterprises in the city. Um, and then I can give you that, I can give you food, but I can't give you representation in the provincial council and the parliament. And they said, and he said, no, if you don't can get that, we don't, we're not interested in local government. And that is, uh, I think that was understandable to take that position. But the point is, it was very, very, it, it wasn't, uh, 
very difficult to integrate South African society there. It's not only the white black thing, it was also that the white community was divided into almost 50 50. And obviously, if you bring in black into parliament, they would side with the English side. And the Afrikaners would be out uh, on the limb. Uh, so they would be faced with a combination of the English, white English speaking South Africans and the black against the Afrikaners. And uh, you could forget about a republic, you could forget about all the other uh, kind of ideas and so on. So the Afrikaners had, uh, had a very, uh, had a very difficult terrain, terrain in which they, they had to stake out their claims. Well, obviously, they, they overreached and they had this uh, enormous. Uh, uh, some enormous mistakes were made. I don't want to sound uh, apologetic about apartheid. Right. And, and, and I mean, Verwoerd had this, I guess, it wasn't just Verwoerd, but he, he definitely framed it. And I guess that's why he's called an architect um, of spatial planning. And, and, and as you say, he was going to, the idea was that the homelands would develop under, you know, under apartheid ideology, the homelands would develop and essentially they would uh, pull the black people out of the cities and you will have prosperity everywhere. And this was sort of the ideological framework of the system. And of course, like all ideologies and all utopians, uh, they, they tend to crash. They, they, they tend to not meet the expectations. And I, I, my understanding is when I read the works of these guys is that they were completely illiterate of economics. They, they didn't understand economic integration. They didn't understand uh, economic development from, I guess, the classical sense, you know, that it is uh, primarily driven by value. It is primarily driven by, um, by land and resources that are not scattered equally across the country. You can't just tell people to move to one place and develop. It's not that simple. And that was the root of I mean, He was in power at the time when the, the social planning, big social planning, was sort of the, the vogue in Western society, not only in South Africa. You know, you have to. And they realized that you, you need kind of the ideas like group areas, like border industry. It doesn't work economically. It was just simply, it was a certain phase when people in the 50s and 60s believed in that. I one in one place I compared him uh, to Robert McNamara, you know, the American minister of justice, who actually was in charge in the, during the Vietnam War, and he was looking at targets in Vietnam, but he didn't realize bombing all these places was not going to bring victory because the, the victory will be brought about by the Viet Cong actually uh, just continue plugging away and and and, 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 and sapping the morale of the nation. Well, there's a very interesting book, I'm not sure if you've read it, by uh, John Ralston Saul called uh, Voltaire's Bastards. And he, he got, he's very critical of um, Mac McMara, and primarily because Mac McMara used to work for Ford uh, Motors. And he tried to run the U.S. military like a, like a company, an industrial company. And it, it just doesn't show with outcomes. And, and uh, he had his own metrics to he wanted to apply. And he said, well, if we killed more Vietnamese than ours, we win, you know, and, and in the reality, Hu Chi Minh and, and uh, th those leaders knew this was not going to win. So wow. he had the wrong conceptual framework when he went into battle. Academics and politics can be very dangerous. You know, it's a, like the Mara is a, is a clear case. And uh, we would also add these big development plans, but it is the whole idea of understand development was never going to work because of the forces of urban integration, you know, that the, 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 all that planning was, it was the forces on the ground that were going to shape everything. Yeah. So I, I think you can off. I enjoyed the conversation. Um, yeah, myself as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think uh, it's, uh, we've got we've gone to the end of our hour. And I, I highly appreciate it. And I would like to invite you again in the future to continue a conversation such as this. Coming back to South Africa. Yeah, thank you very much.